Hello. Well, did you think this was actually quite a small painting? It's uh, context is everything, isn't it? And uh, if you thought that was like a really nice small portrait and then I sit down and I'm like, oh my God, it's massive. <laughs> oh, it still makes me laugh. And uh, that's a really healthy thing to have enough of a sense of humour about yourself that you don't take yourself too seriously, but you take yourself seriously enough. There's a really fine balance there, isn't there? Oh, uh, hello. <laughs> Welcome to Seeing Clearly with Charlotte Giblin. And I am here today to talk about uh, identity and how we perceive ourselves or just scratch the surface of this other huge and fascinating topic about the way we, we perceive ourselves both visually and, and from a, a personality perspective as well and how that is, is received. Now, this painting... Oh, just it fills me with so much joy <laughs> when I was doing it. A couple of years ago, my partner Pete came, actually when I finished it, um, Pete came down and he just went, ah, who's that? And, you know, I mean, giving me enough encouragement because he, he takes my work seriously enough. He knows it's really important to me, but also... He sees something very different when, when he looks at me and uh, this is not what he sees and it's not what a lot of other people see. I mean, of course, when you are with somebody else, when you're talking to somebody, even when you're static, there is three-dimensional animation. There is some kind of movement, even if, if very slight. And so capturing any still image, whether it's in a, a photograph or a, in this case, a painting, can be really misleading. And we can judge ourselves so harshly, can't we, when we see these still images? I mean, how many times have you looked uh, at a photograph that someone else has taken and of a group possibly and you ignore everybody else in the group and you just look at yourself and go oh my goodness or oh you know there are different reactions as to whether the image that comes back to us is how we perceive ourselves because we are looking down at our bodies and when we're looking in a mirror of course, we see something different or we might hold a certain pose in the mirror just to, you know, see, see what we think other people see or what we want them to see. And I've always been fascinated by um, my, my face, the way I look um, from a, a curious perspective, from a, a perspective of curiosity, I should say, from, a, and because I've been drawing myself since I was a child and then did a lot of focus on my face as a teenager through art classes. I've noticed all of the, you know, the, the subtle and more dramatic changes to my face over the years and to my skin. And, and I'm really intrigued by it. It, um, it's never worried me, you know, the, the aging process, um, bring on menopause, <laughs> no, I'm getting close. But it, I find it really intriguing as to how the body changes and how skin changes. You know, I notice all the, you know, the, the different textures that start appearing. And yeah, of course, there have been years and really long periods of time where I felt very insecure about the way I looked. My shape has changed enormously over time. Uh, I, my face has changed shape a great deal as I've, as I've got older. Um, I wear glasses all the time now. For a, for a while, I wore contact lenses, which, of course, totally changes the way somebody looks. You know, my hair has changed a lot over the years and now completely comfortable with all the wonderful silver coming through. Love that. And just keeping it really short. It's, it's how it suits my kind of hair, which is very thin. Uh, but we have these ideas of, of what we, we look like. And when we get something reflected back, which isn't what we're expecting, it can either shock or, or delight. And I have a story that I've been telling my friends, anybody who will listen for such a long time that, and it, 
it kind of defies the whole notion of the physical insecurity that I have felt through the years, because that's what is often reflected back to us. We see the images in the magazines on the, the screens of what we perceive to be a beauty of that time or what we think we ought to look like to be considered beautiful, to be accepted. And I know that the, the beauty standards have changed hugely over the decades and the idea of beauty is continuing to evolve all the time, which is very healthy. But I think, uh, and I speak for myself as a, as a woman, the, the ways that I've tried to compete or not compete with, with other women uh, is, is really um, quite shocking. You know, the whole, the way that I felt encouraged to, socially speaking, to compete and, and sort of fight for the, you know, the, the best male or the best partner and, and the pressure that that can put on friendships, the pressure that that can, we can create for ourselves is just next level. It's absolutely ridiculous. So anyway, this story, um, I, ever since I was quite a young teenager I, and I would you know, stare in the mirror, you know, really intrigued by, I would look at my, my eyes, my irises. And if you look at your irises really closely, you can actually see them moving and sort of breathing. It's absolutely fascinating. And I would, you know, hold certain poses and, and you know, look, look in the mirror. And I would think, wow, <laughs> I'm so beautiful. I mean, genuinely think that. And never this whole like, oh gosh, you know, trying to hide from, from the mirror. I would just really look at my face and, and, and think to myself, I, why doesn't anybody else see this? And why doesn't anybody else think that I'm beautiful in the way that I do? Because all around me then, you know, reality was reflected back where people didn't respond to me in that way. They, you know, because of course we have movement, we have sound, we have personality, which is, which is mixed in. And I'm, I'm tall. So maybe I was quite an intimidating, boisterous, obnoxious character that people shied away from. And in later years, I've always been so grateful that I've ended up being the best friend character rather than the girlfriend. You know, if we're looking at Hollywood roles, I'm never the leading lady. I was always the one who helped support everybody else. And that has meant I've had just wonderful, enduring friendships with men and women and refused to compete in this sort of pit of, of beauty, the beauty pageant of going to the bar and, and trying to, you know, win the, you know, the, the partner, it just, that's just never been my thing, but it's partly in my whole backpack of emotional roles and identity that I carry with me. And if you've seen any of my videos before, then you'll know that I adopted a role really early on of responsibility for others, really feeling that I wanted other people to, uh, I put their needs before my own. So even in this whole arena, you know, I spent of attracting a mate. I spent years actually um, quite abusing my body to um, a disappointing degree, but partly because I wanted to remove myself from competition and make sure that all of my friends who really seem to, to want to get a partner, to want to, to couple up, that they would have, you know, a distinct advantage over me. So I, I created this really interesting vortex of, of um, identity questions and crises and, and uh, a duplicity where I would look in the mirror on my own and, and think really positive thoughts about myself. And then out in, in the real world, I had to adjust all of that. And I think about the you know, the talent shows that are so prevalent and have been for decades now, where it's really clear that somebody will go on stage, maybe it's to sing, and nobody in their close circle has told them 
that they can't sing well or that possibly this is they've, they've just wanted to really inspire this person to give it a go and maybe that's the most important element in anybody's life is to give it give something a go however we do need to have a sense of reality and where we actually adjust our expectations to fit reality. Now, it's, that's not about destroying your dreams when you really feel like you're driven to do something. But at no point did I approach any modeling agency and say, well, uh, hello, is your next cover model for Vogue? Um, because I understand that although I could appreciate something, some beauty within me, and how wonderful that I felt that and I could see that, how lucky that I had that confidence of something within me. But I looked around me and I saw the different beauty standards and, and I understood that I don't, didn't fit that mold. And so I have a, an understanding of reality. I'm not completely removed from it. And those layers are so complex, but really helpful. They really helped me to get to this point of, of transformation and working through all of my fears and anxiety. Like one huge element of that was recognising, and it's taken a long time, and still working at it sometimes, recognising the difference between who I think I am, what I think is, is good for me, and who I actually am, and what is actually good for me in reality. And we can have all kinds of fantasies about who we are, who we want to be, who we perceive ourselves to be, our own importance in everybody else's lives, Ooh, now that is something that I really, really put on a pedestal for such a long time. I considered myself, because of this role of responsibility I took for everybody else, like I was indispensable and so important in all these people's lives. No, I'm just, I'm very important in my life and for the very small circle of people immediately around me. But we've all got our own things going on and I'm not important at all to the vast majority of people. And we, But we don't like to think that because our ego needs to place us in a position of, of importance, of, of value. We, our insecurities demand that we receive positive feedback, that we receive acknowledgement, that we understand that we are of worth and of value. And we've been convinced that the only way to do that is by mass appreciation. We've lost the ability to feel rewarded when one or two people really appreciate what we do. And that has been part of my journey to bring it right back to teenage dreams that I had of I describe it in my book of ripples in the grass going out from my feet, sort of ripples of positivity, which I would hang on to when I was really anxious about the world and what was happening and felt totally disconnected. And I would think, well, look, if I can just send out these positive ripples of, of thoughts, of words, of, of actions, then the ripples in the grass would catch on someone else's feet and they'd feel them and then they would be able to send out ripples. It was an understanding of the, the connectedness of it all and the importance of impacting one person once we have been able to positively impact ourselves. Because of course, everything has to start with ourselves and, and be about ourselves to the greatest degree. And there is a reason why on a plane you are instructed to put your own mask on first if, there's a, if the oxygen masks drop and then put masks on the children or the people around you because you have to look after yourself first to be able to then look after everybody else. And this point comes right back to our perception of 
of what we can achieve, what we are able to achieve versus what we think we should be doing. And I had such huge dreams about what, you know, where I thought I should be and how fast I thought I should be developing and how much money I should be earning and all of these different standards, which are who knows where they actually come from, but were completely misaligned with who I actually am with my energy levels, with the amount of time I need to spend on my own as an artist, as a a human being, just I, I need a lot of alone time. I go for walks on my own. It's just wonderfully recharging. I spend a vast amount of time in imaginary worlds that I've had with me the same characters who have been evolving in all sorts of different imaginary worlds since I was a child. And I pop into those whenever I need to escape or recharge. It's incredibly important to me. And so some of the ideas of where I thought my career should be going for the longest period of time were to do with an influence over a large group and affecting a large number of people. And and having the attention of a large number of people. And I came to the conclusion that probably that wouldn't suit me, or at least I had to evolve and grow, change the way I behave, the way I think about myself and create new boundaries. And this is, it's so key to understanding at root, you know, and accepting at root, who we actually are and and what we're able to achieve because there is just we're bombarded with really cruel comparisons constantly and we get caught in this hamster wheel of trying to live up to what somebody else perceives uh, which we then adopt as what we perceive to be right for us how we we think we ought to be looking behaving how much money we should be earning, so many really cruel Western standards which are totally inappropriate for a great deal of us. And we've lost the ability to have a a real confidence in the small but powerful impact that almost goes under the radar. And this is one of the many reasons why I do these one-on-one conversational monologue, no edit videos, because this is my opportunity to just sit and have a chat to you as if we're over a, having a coffee together. And, and I'm just telling you stories about my life and connecting and, and wanting it to be real and removing any of this sort of obligation of, of how I feel a video should be put together or worrying about what other, you know, what viewers are expecting. This is about me taking control and knowing I'm not interested in all of the tech side of things. I'm interested in storytelling and connecting on a human level and talking about my paintings because they can show, they can give such a stark, a really strong visual representation of what I'm saying. But that adjustment, that balance of what I thought was right for me and what actually is right for me, that's taken a really long time to fully accept and embrace. And I still struggle with it every now and then. So when I painted this, this was the first time I'd sat down with a mirror and done a self-portrait probably for 25 years. And because all of the paintings I'd done on myself prior, if you've seen any of the other videos, they're with me climbing out of the paintings. Um, They were all done from photographs because I wanted to show really uncomfortable uh, positions where there was a real sense of of balance or or pull and totally impossible for me to have, have done those live or to hold those determined expressions for a long period of time. And I, it's all done, it's just done with one colour, just with burnt umber and a, a soft brush and a palette knife. And I, 
I was really, really careful measuring. And if you've seen, if you're an artist yourself, or you've seen artists measuring with the pencil and, and even with a ruler, you know, I was measuring all of my, my features and because I know as a, as a teacher, how challenging it can be to get portraits right. And especially when you're looking at your own face, because we think we look differently to the way we actually look. And holding this, you know, still pose for a very long period of time and my jaw started to get quite clenched. And even with the eyes, you know, I could see that I wasn't quite looking at, at the mirror because I was so focused on, on, on the other eye that I was, I was painting. But when I, I stepped back from it and it was, did I say it was done in a day? It was done in a day, you know, a, a, block, of, a block of hours. And all of the painting was was done in one one block because I wanted to make sure that I could, if there were areas which were smudged, that the paint wasn't going to, to dry. And when I stepped back from it, whew, it really gave me chills. And part of it was disappointment of, oh my goodness, do I actually look like that? And part of it was, wow, that I'm seeing a steely determination that hasn't been in my work since those early self-portraits where I am climbing out of the, the frame. The determined version of me and 2021, huge changes for me that year with stopping teaching, uh, finishing the book and getting that really, you know, I, I took time out to, to write the book. I pulled myself back from, from teaching full time. It was uh, post COVID and everything, you know, I discovered that I was no longer feeling any of the anxiety and fear that I had previously. So I was adjusting to this totally new version of myself with a a very different kind of global backdrop than what I would have expected, feeling light and full of trust and love. And, and then this came out. And very few people who see this recognize me in it unless they know me very well. And then there's this, oh, there's this determined warrior in there. And there's part of me which really feels that I have that warrior inside of me, that strength, that determination. And, and yet, I really didn't want to see that person looking back at me. I wanted to see a very different kind of character. I wanted to see, you know, your typical beauty, something softer. And the hardness in, in this alarmed me a little bit. And, and yet over the, the years, I mean, I love getting this painting out and even the, the uncomfortable fact that I, I put her quite high in the frame, which really bothered one of my friends. She's like, ah, just want to lower it down so there's even canvas above and below. And I actually wanted to make people feel a little bit uncomfortable with the painting. And that's a real change because... For so much of my life, I've been people pleasing and wanting to make sure everyone feels comfortable, not uncomfortable. So there are many, many different aspects of this painting which have show, which show, reflect back to me a huge shift in my behaviour and my feelings about myself and about others. But it's not the way I think or thought that I look, and. Being able to have the courage to actually look within, not just, I'm not just talking about the exterior, because although there is a, a lot of that within the, the text that I've been, or the words I've been saying, the, this really is about a character, the, a true character being shown on the outside. And we, have, we place so much weight and emphasis just on the, you know, this bit on the outside and forget that our character and our spirit completely alters all of this anyway. And if I did look like that, if I do look like that, as soon as you walk in the room or we start having a conversation, my face completely changes because the animation and the spirit comes out. 
So when you do look at photographs of yourself or you do look in the mirror and you hold that mm, pose and you try and like see, well, what do other people, what are other people seeing? They never ever see what you think they see because they see your life and your animation. They don't see that held pose at this, you know, with two thirds or three quarters with the hair just so. And that is really a good thing, helpful thing to remember. Don't be hard on yourself when you look at those photographs and, and your heart sinks or your heart lifts like it used to with me. And I think, yay, gosh, I really do look fantastic. That's too brilliant. If um, Pete thinks I'm getting a little bit, you know, if my ego is getting a bit too swollen, he will say to me, oh, oh you know, oh, Charlotte, it's, it's for you, phone's for you. Oh, it's, it's Vogue. <laughs> it's just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Still waiting for Vogue to call. That's totally fine. So, oh, self-image. Oh, my goodness. So much to talk about there. A lot of food for thought. That's really set me off. I'm going to have a wonderful day now thinking about all the ways that I have um, inflated my self-importance and, and all the ways that I've corrected that and maybe given myself a hard time and held myself back because of all of the shoulds. And looking inside and embracing with the challenge of embracing who you really are is very, very freeing if you can have the confidence to then start applying that new self-knowledge into your actions, into your life, into your behavior around other people and, and not trying to fit into the mold that so much of success and failure, you know, that, that are just put out there. And yeah, good words for me to hear as well on this. I'm filming this on, New Year's Eve. So what a perfect little reminder for me as well, just to embrace who I really am and the people around me who love that version of myself will be even happier that I'm embracing it, not striving to be something that I'm not, like the, the skinny Vogue cover model of years gone by that I thought I matched up to. Oh, brilliant. I'll see you in the next one. That's going to make me laugh all day.